So in the S&C world, we're often looking to improve a couple of different qualities in athletes. So we're looking to improve their strength, their power output and their speed. So this can be done through a variety of different means and coaches will use a couple of different methods to do this. Oftentimes we'll have this kind of broken down into two different camps. So we'll have the combination of traditional resistance training plus plyometrics. So this would include high force movements in isolation by themselves in the gym. This would be things like squats, bench, deadlifts, pressing, and then the associated assistance movements we'd see with stuff like this. So maybe rowing, split squats, pull-ups, general upper body and lower body hypertrophy, isolation movements. Then in combination with this, we'd see traditional plyometric training. So depth jumps, bounds, repeated hops, long jumps, the usual plyometric stuff we see that we know works quite effectively. Then on the other side of this, we would have the use of the weightlifting movements. Now, weightlifting movements are notorious for improving athlete strength, power, speed, coordination, and agility, but have their own issues when it comes to improving them. Now, these are often used to increase the athlete's strength and power, but oftentimes this kind of splits people down the middle, whether the use of weightlifting movements is worth it due to the potential injury risk, and more importantly, the massive learning curve involved in doing the lifts for athletes. So what really we need to see is, is there a significant benefit to using the weightlifting movements or do the lower skill curve, traditional resistance training and plyometric movements work sufficiently well and there is any need or is there any need to justify the use of the weightlifting movements? So today's paper is looking at just that. So we're going to be looking at a paper, a meta-analysis or a systematic review with meta-analysis of the combination of traditional resistance training plus plyometrics in comparison versus the weightlifting movements. Now, just to give you a little heads up, this paper may or may not be of good value. It is out in 2022 and it is published in Springer. So it's recent and it is a uh, in a notable journal. So it has some value, it's been cited twice. The title is Comparison of Weightlifting, Traditional Resistance Training, and plyometrics and strength, power and speed, a systematic review with meta-analysis. So essentially, Morris and Co. were looking for the comparison of a variety of different studies to compare traditional resistance training, so just normal strength training plus normal plyometric training in comparison on a couple of different variables versus kind of weightlifting on these variables of markers of strength, speed and power. So methods, essentially what they were looking for was a measure of strength, speed and power. The systematic review, including peer reviewed articles, typical meta analysis or systematic review. Uh, so reviewed articles that were a couple of different studies that would have criteria in these studies. So they were looking at these. Did they match their criteria? They wanted a certain power number, a certain size number, power number of these groups. And then they were going to get a couple of different factors and outcomes from these to see if they could compare them and get some meaningful data from the resistance training plus plyometrics versus the weightlifting on these couple of different metrics. So some of the metrics we were looking at were low weightlifting and load lifted, counter movement jump, so a very, very common one we'll see in strength and conditioning papers is that counter movement jump, a very popular one, often measured and almost exclusively measured on a force place in the last kind of 20 odd years. So in terms of linear sprint speed, we're also looking at change of direction and squat, jump performance and strength. So there are a couple of different metrics we're looking at, which Dara is gonna go through now and he's gonna let us know what kind of results we got. Then we're gonna discuss those results. Did you eat the whole loaf? So in the results section of this paper, we start to see some of the possible issues or some of the talking points we're gonna bring up later on, right? So 16 papers were pulled out. Uh, we we saw around 420 something uh, contributants uh, overall basically the paper starts to be written from this point onwards as a weightlifting in comparison to strength training and weightlifting in comparison to plyometrics paper which is absolutely okay but just so you know when you are moving forward this is being viewed through the eyes of weightlifting right so first thing weightlifting versus traditional resistance training significant effect in weightlifting performance so the groups that did snatch and clean and jerk got better at snatch and clean and jerk and a large significant effect for sprint speed and change of direction, right? So kind of what we would expect um, just from where they sit on that force velocity curve, we would expect sprint speed to be better in the weightlifting group than it would be in the traditional strength training group. Uh, but it's interesting nonetheless. 
Next, we have weightlifting being compared to plyometric training. What we see here is we see no significant effects. Uh, so no significant effects in their comparison. Um, so you see obvious improvements in speed, obvious improvements in change direction, but no real difference between the groups here, right? So it's a bit of a kind of a, a null and void point to, to bring up. But when you look at what you're testing and what you're testing is counter movement jump, squat jump, uh, the change of direction test changed across the studies, which is not ideal. But the, the most important thing to note here is that there's no real difference in these 16 papers between the use of weightlifting movements and plyometric movements for these certain testing parameters. Who cares about the 90 kilo strongman class? Nobody cares. So on to our kind of discussion piece now, right? And look, this might have caught me on a bad day. It might be that Dara didn't get a lot of sleep last night, but I'll certainly be kind of pushing back against this paper fairly hard here. So please don't take it personally, any of the authors. The first thing is, recently we tend to see meta-analyses, systematic reviews brought up a huge amount, uh, both of those being used as the kind of gold standard in research, right? So you'll see somebody talking about creatine use and they'll bring up a meta-analysis or you'll hear someone talking about weightlifting versus biometrics and they'll bring up meta-analysis. In fact, for most cases, it's not the gold standard in, in scientific research, right? The gold standard would be a randomized control trial, right? Where, where you have an actual control group, if everybody randomized, uh, that's what gold standard is. Reviews are really important and really valuable in a narrative sense. So if you're a coach or you're an athlete and you're looking into something, a review is a good way to kind of figure out what's been done in the area uh, what's the kind of general consensus coming up to right now, particularly if you have a number of re reviews done in the last decade. Uh, it can be interesting to see what the kind of current findings are. Or if you've had no reviews done for a long time and then you get one that comes out, you can get quite comprehensive results from it. This isn't really the case with this review. Uh, there's a, a number of issues. The issues include like, difference in training protocols across the different groups so it did say that all of the weightlifting uh, groups had snatch clean and jerk some derivatives of the lift and some strength accessory work but as you well know across a, a weightlifters year or across different systems of programming and weightlifting you could have a massive emphasis on strength training a massive emphasis on speed and power training a massive emphasis on just the lifts a big emphasis on just bodybuilding and accessory work you know so they're really not comparable to just say a weightlifting intervention is a weightlifting intervention and that's all that matters uh, when you know there's massive amounts of inter-individual differences with those. The next thing is the spread across duration is massive in these studies, right? So across 16 studies, you've got durations lasting anywhere from six weeks to 28 weeks, particularly when you're looking for a physiological outcome uh, from a training protocol six week probably isn't going to cut it. Now, 28 weeks is great. 28 weeks is really comprehensive. Um, but expecting values A to be comparable to values B really isn't fair in this case, right? Because that's those studies really aren't, uh, are in no way similar. They're in no way comparable. So that's the main thing I would say is like, take everything you're reading here with a grain of salt. Like, understand that although we can say something in the paper here that... Uh, like there's, there's one quote where they talk about you would expect weightlifting movements to be better for sprinting and power production due to the fact that all traditional strength training is quite slow. And then they quote a paper that looks at squat speeds at different intensities, you know, when when a lot of intensities for the weightlifting movements haven't even been uh, quoted in the study. So you do need to be very conscious when you're looking at a review paper like this, that it's oftentimes not the best source to get your information from. So a lot of times you will see in scientific literature and if you read enough of it and you look at enough journals, you'll often see these things all the way from nutrition up into like speed and power of training. You'll see a meta-analysis or a narrative review. Of course, though, the systematic review or the narrative development or narrative articles are often only a, as good as the kind of some of their parts, so some of the quality of their studies. And so a lot of times we'll see lately, especially, you know, on uh, Instagram or people who... Uh, are like scientifically literate will send out these things or post these things and say meta-analysis on this so this is why this is wrong 
uh, without actually having looked at the paper. So it's definitely something to be aware of just because you see a meta-analysis or a systematic review doesn't necessarily mean that the results are foolproof or guaranteed. I think there's a little bit of, a little bit too much in the last few years and specifically with kind of, I suppose, influencers in certain realms who talk about this, they'll see a meta-analysis and have automatically assumed that a meta-analysis trumps a randomized control trial or a individual study that showed one thing. Now, if there's multiple meta-analysis across 10 years, across a decade, showing different things with continuous updated studies with good quality ones, if four or five of these are showing us that there is a definite trend in one direction and we have mechanistic actions behind that and solid logical reasons, if you can't discover the mechanistic action, then it's certainly definitely worth playing into. If stuff makes sense from analysis in conjunction with these other things, then we also need to use our interpretation, which is essentially all of scientific data is just being interpreted and then applied to the real world, especially when it comes to strength and conditioning. So with that said, the results themselves still make sense in this, regardless of those issues. It's interesting in this case that while the studies should have been more homogenized or as close as possible or selected, or if not possible, then maybe the meta-analysis shouldn't have been done. But when we're looking for real world values, it's actually useful that there's a variety of different values specifically for the weightlifting ones. So we saw a different number of variables included in those, but we still saw improvement across all groups and we still saw essentially similar improvements across all traits that we're looking for across both of these kind of groups versus each other. So that tells us one thing, and it's something that we've talked about a lot and it's interesting to see here, is that the weightlifting movements are great for what people use them for, but given their steep learning curve, they may not necessarily be the best option. Now, some coaches, I know for example, Zach Delander loves using the Olympic lifts. And for Zach's point of view, when he's coaching his athletes, he's super able to coach them. When they come into his gym or when he's in a gym with them, it's no problem for Zach to teach him because he's extensive experience with those athletes and he can do this no problem. But when it comes to a lot of people watching this, we'll frequently ask, people will ask us, they'll be saying, hey lads, I'll be testing the club or team members at the end of this season, what do you think the best things to teach them are? You know? And like, they're not in a situation where they've clean and jerked 170 plus themselves and they have a deep understanding of weightlifting spent the time looking at it. What would be a lot easier for them is learning how to teach depth jumps, which is a very, very simple metrics that we'd look for. We'd look for a minimum ground reaction time or minimum ground contact time. We'd be looking at normal box jumps, maybe look at single leg hops or something like that. Some things that are very, very simple, things that athletes can learn very, very easily, things that they can scale and progress and load very, very simply. And their learning curve is very, very, very small. The learning curve you need to get for weightlifting is not necessarily the maximum elite efficient technique but there is certainly a minimum threshold you need to get where you need to get a minimum percentage of your body weight lifting specifically in power cleans oftentimes it's somewhere in the region you know of it could be anywhere depending on what studies you look for it can be under body weight or it can be slightly over it for example if we look at um heavier throwers or more proficient throwers we'll see them getting close to like one and a half times body weight in power cleans now for an individual athlete, this is very, very useful. But if we went, for example, for a team of late teen rugby players, we have a group of 20, maybe 25 talented athletes who are all highly competitive, who are very sore, very injured, and not really in the mood to learn a new lift, or not really in the physical capacity to learn a new lift. It's a lot easier for them to simply learn how to hop, which they already pretty much intrinsically know. If they're talented athletes, they'll pick it up quite quickly. And it's not even that these athletes couldn't pick up the lifts. It's very, very likely, given several years or several off seasons, that, for example, these rugby players, these late teen rugby players, if we're using them as an example, would learn the lifts quite well. And if you could spend time with the mobility in them, they could certainly get the weights heavy enough that would be productive enough for their rugby, for example. So, given the context, I think that it's kind of a cis scenario argument that maybe we're being biased in this scenario because we are differing from the conclusion that the auditors actually came for in the meta analysis is that our kind of way is, or what we promote is, if you can teach the Olympic lifts, then it's great. And if the athlete wants to do that and are willing to dedicate the time and are in a position to do it, then you'll definitely get benefit. But if you're not able to teach them, the plyometrics and strength training, high force training, and then separating your high speed training will work very, very, very well. So if we read the conclusion, it seems like the others had a little bias towards the weightlifting movements being useful, even though it doesn't really say what they are doesn't really back up what they're saying. So the current study revealed that weightlifting is an effective training method to improve strength, counter movement jump, squat movement jump, and sprint speed performance, which I would agree with for sure. Would you agree with? No. You wouldn't agree with? No. 
because they've made a glaring error where they say mm-hmm. weightlifting training is an effective method to improve strength. Yes. Whereas every weightlifting program in the 16 studies had strength movements in it. Yes. So like it would be like saying if someone was taking Panadol and some diarrhea medication mm-hmm. and then they said, oh, Panadol helps with diarrhea. We're like, well, it was probably the diarrhea medication made them better at that. I'd agree with yes. everything else and I'm definitely being pedantic in this. But I suppose in the fact that it this would weightlifting movements would improve the average athlete's strength levels so unless they're already fairly proficient at strength it's likely the weightlifting movements would make them stronger because it's unlikely that they're very strong as it is anyway yeah but they can't really yes. say it in a paper no i no, I agree with yeah you. yeah so when compared with alternative training modalities weightlifting may elicit additional benefits above that of traditional resistance training alone which i don't think anyone would expect i don't think anyone would expect that strength training would also make you faster you don't see any really snc coaches just doing strength training and then assuming that this will also transfer over to explosive movements hence the often asked and queried is weightlifting versus plyometric movements so i don't know I don't think this is a particular representation of the current cultural activities of SNC coaches. So resulting in greater improvements in weightlifting and counter movement jump performance. Weightlifting plyo may result in similar improvements in the strength, jump performance and speed. Overall, these four findings support that the notion that if the training goal is to improve strength, power and speed, the inclusion of weightlifting exercises within phases of training cycle may be advantageous to target goal specific adaptions while also promoting the development of a well-rounded athlete sponsored by the IWF. Not joking, it's not. The only thing I would definitely argue for in the case of weightlifting that would also that would have above uh, plyometrics, for example, is we have the dynamic movement under load. So dynamic movement under load for plyometric training is a lot more difficult to get. It's a lot more difficult to load uh, in the kind of fashion that we get from weightlifting. So when we get to cleans, it really is aggressively dynamic and resisting these forces under load. It's not as easy to get these through weighted jumps or weighted trap bar jumps, for example. It's not as easy to get those, that same kind of stimulus that we're getting from say heavy cleans. Resisting a heavy clean at the bottom with something you know close to one and a half times body weight is very, very beneficial. Is it necessary for an elite athlete? Absolutely not. We know that's I mean, not true, but it does have a slight advantage in that trait. Is that trait necessary? Probably more dependent on the sport and the athletes, for example, that would be useful for rugby players. The other interesting thing on that is like, if you were to elicit that similar response with plyometrics, mm-hmm. it would be a far more dangerous undertaking. Yes. Like if you wanted that same kind of resisting one and a half times body weight, your height for a drop jump would be massive. Mm -hmm. You know, when people talk about weightlifting being the dangerous kind of training element, where it's like, if you want to elicit that same response, the the danger element would be so much higher with getting people to do plyos with a weighted vest on or something. Yes, yeah. So where does it leave us? Well, it depends. Unfortunately, it's always, a lot of the time is the answer. So it depends on what you can teach, what your athletes are doing. But I think you should be safe in the knowledge if you don't want to use Olympic lifts, I'm pretty sure, and we'll see as the narrative progresses over the years, but I'm pretty sure that strength training, plyometric training will do perfectly well. I don't think it's going to be the game changer. Where it really re- leaves us is with randomised placebo controlled trials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which I'm sure there is out there. Yeah. Uh, trawling through the literature, there's so many articles published every year that... It is difficult. Now, I know if you're undertaking a meta analysis, that's the yoke you are expected to carry. But it is difficult. You will give the authors some slack in that regard. Yeah, I think their initial thrall had 3,800 and something papers, you know, mm-hmm. just yes. from their initial searching. Like that's months of work. Yeah, it's a waiting undertaking. Because they'd have to read all of those. I'm sure they would have screened them pretty fast, but yeah. still. Uh, so interesting. Carry the thoughts about the meta analysis, you know, just make sure that the person you listen to is scientifically literate and uh, they're not just you know seeing a meta analysis and then reading the abstract and then reading the conclusion the paper says and being like cool but you do you'd be surprised you'd be very surprised oh you'd be surprised thanks for watching